On episode five of Office Hours with Dr. Guy, we're going to talk about finding sources, proposal defenses, and hacking your dissertation. Bring your questions to Office Hours with Dr. Guy. Hey everybody, and welcome and happy Monday to you all. I've had just an amazing weekend. I'm really excited to be here with you at the beginning of the week. As I said last week, I love Mondays. I love Mondays. And you know, this, this week is going to be really intense for me. My beautiful wife, doctor wife, and uh, my two and a half children are out of town. And uh, they're enjoying some time away vacationing with grandma. And accordingly, I have a lot of time to get a lot done. You know, I got some big changes coming in the show. Got a lot happening in my personal and professional life, and, and I'm just excited. I'm kind of teasing here. There's a lot coming this week that I really look forward to sharing with you as things unfold. And, uh, you know, last night uh, was my first night in a long time hanging out with the guys. We had a poker night, and uh, I'm not much of a gambler, but just, just being able to sit with uh, some of my core friends after many years of just working really hard and not having a lot of time to do that is just it was so great just to hang out with them. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you're working full-time on your dissertation and elsewhere, and that's keeping you away from the things that you love to do. And so uh, and that's why you're here, so you can get answers and move forward. So let's answer some of your questions. Bruce asks, I do use Google Scholar, but was wondering, other than ProQuest, do you have any other tips on where to find data? Bruce, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for commenting. First-time commenter on Facebook. Thank you. So there's lots here, I mean, uh, different levels. So the first level I want to say is that this is all coming off of a discussion that we had on a previous episode about where do you start. And the number one place that we start are dissertations and books. And why dissertations? Well, dissertations are the place to start regarding very similar to your topic because dissertations have this awesome thing at the end called a works cited references page. And you're able to look at all the sources that they've accessed and the key is you have to have a fresh look at those sources. You can't simply rely on what their dissertation said about those sources. Go back to those original sources and see what they're pulling from so you have your own, yourself an original dissertation and you're, you're getting a fresh take on, on those sources. So, so that, that'll lead you to books. So dissertations leads to books often and studies too. But, but why books? Well, because books ha are you know, what they call the seminal authors of your topic, of your, of your research areas that you're considering in your purpose statement. So you want to start with books because that's going to be the foundational layer for everything else. Lots of, lots of chairs say, well, you can't rely so much on books. That's an interesting statement because to talk about the history of something, you know, the, the studies only exist for a certain period of time. You know, it's like... Um, maybe the last 60, 70, 80 years, there might be, I mean, even 80 is stretching it. There might be some study from, from at some point, but you've really, I mean, 1950 and before, finding like some kind of research study about something is really difficult. So naturally, books are really important, especially when you're talking about the history, and that's what you have to do in a literature review, is talk about the entire history of your topic in some way, and so books are necessary for that. But also, it really points to who are the big names in your in your fields of interest, in your, in your areas of interest. And for that reason, that'll lead you to some research that they've conducted. These people love to cite themselves in those books. So chances are they have some of that information there but as well as about what studies they've written. So, but to get back to your question, you know, when I hear people using Google Scholar, Google Scholar is a great tool. In my opinion, it's really good at leading you to a source but it's not necessarily really good at delivering the full source to you because some of the sources that they have are, are copyrighted, of course, many of them are. And so they're not able to give you the most recent, the greatest, the latest, the greatest um, because they don't have the licensing that, that, that's required for you to get at all that good stuff. That's why I recommend ProQuest and why I recommend, I mean, there's many other databases out there, but I would, you know, ProQuest is my go-to of choice. And, and I, you know, when I hear your question, I mean, not to bash your question, Bruce, but just to say, when I, when I hear other than ProQuest, I mean, ProQuest, I mean, for myself, you know, I think 90% of my playing outside of books, 90% of my play in my own dissertation was in ProQuest. Uh, most of my candidates work in ProQuest. And that's, it's such a powerful tool. And here's why, because you can advance, limit, search everything. Uh, you can, you know, and it, first of all, if you're, you go into ProQuest, you don't have to log into ProQuest. 
uh, not you, Bruce, but anyone who's watching this, if you don't know how to log into ProQuest, ca call your librarian and say, how do I log into ProQuest and use this thing? Your school is paying tens of thousands of dollars or more to use that source, I imagine, that database. So, uh, for, so figure out how to use it. And I think that the best way to do that is go into it and click on Advanced Search and you'll see all the options. And this is where you can put uh, your search terms in there. And here's how the best way to do it. Let's say you're searching teaching strategies. Well, if you put teaching strategies and you search for that, it's going to look for teaching and it's going to look for strategies. And it's going to do both of those. And you're going to have lots of sources that are not applicable. So I always recommend clicking Advanced Search and put quotation marks on either side of that term. Quote, teaching strategies, close quote. And what that will do is that will limit ProQuest to only look for that exact term, teaching strategies. Now, you're going to have lots of other terms you're probably searching for, teaching strategies and secondary schools. So teaching strategies, secondary schools. And you can put that in the, the two separate little search areas there. Not only that, but you can limit to full text only. Click the full text only button. And then you can also click the limit to scholarly sources only. Uh, I think that button's there. And what you can do then is you'll get a much more vetted list. And keep in mind, finding the first sources are always, are always the most difficult. Once you find some sources, they will lead you to others. Notice who those authors cite. They're going to lead you to where you need to be looking. Oh, and as a side note, Bruce, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that when you say the word data in your question, I'm assuming you mean research and not you know, hard data uh, in terms of, in terms of you know, some studies. Of, naturally, you're looking for studies that have data. But if you're looking for some like hard statistics, I'd, I, I would recommend going to statistics.gov. I think that's the website. Yeah, statistics.gov. And, and you'll find some amazing stuff there, man. Ivy and a bunch of other people ask, any safeguards to offer when defending your dissertation proposal? Ivy, how are you? Facebook commenter, first time Facebook commenter. Uh, thank you for your engagement online and uh, the, your multiple comments. Loving that. Big props to you. So dissertation proposal defense. Every single person that's watching this will go through a dissertation proposal defense where you take Either you know, some, for some people it's very formal. You know, it might be the, all the committee members together in a room or on a conference call. Sometimes a little bit less formal. It's more of an approval process that go, that happens online, where where someone you know you send out your proposal to one person, and they they go and they they send it between them, and they all approve or or ask for changes. So for everyone here, you will be going through this. Now, you said safeguards. So that's an interesting word there. What I would say is. I can tell already, and rightfully so, you're thinking this, is there's kind of a level of alertness that goes into, a level of alarm that goes into going into a proposal defense. It feels much more serious. It is. But I want to comfort you a little bit here and just say, the, if your chair and your committee have agreed to allow you to sit in a proposal defense, already you are sitting in a, a pretty good spot there because they wouldn't let you sit in that room or at least uh, no good chair and no good committee member worth, worth their socks would let you sit in that room unless you were absolutely prepared and ready to defend that proposal. So given that, what I would just say is uh, safeguards, you know, number one, talk about yourself. Start, I, you know, I recommend a sandwich approach here. There's, there should be three phases to your proposal defense. And I recommend you support yourself with a PowerPoint of some kind, some kind of presentation. You know, I wouldn't naturally have the PowerPoint be the entire focus. Let you and your words be the focus. But I recommend that you have this sort of sandwich approach. Number one, talk about you. What brought you to this program? And what was the journey that led you to this research topic? And do two to three slides, hopefully using photos, about you know you before the doctoral program. And then finally, you going into the doctoral program. And then finally, you discovering this topic of interest that is of great importance to you. And tell that story. Because people don't, you know, even dissertation chairs care much more about the people involved than the research. And I, I, I'll quote this, you know, 
uh, until the world ends here, is that people care about people first more than research. And yeah, I know there's some weird guy in, a, in like a lab somewhere that doesn't talk to people and he likes the research more. But most people, most human people love people more than they do the research. So talk about you for a little bit and what brought you to this program. And then get into that middle, that meat of your presentation, which is all, which all the basics. You know, you're going to go into the formal intro. What it, you know, and really you're just going logic, piece by piece logic from your, from your chapter one. What is leading to a very general problem that you are seeing out there in the world? In your background and problem section, what's leading to a specific problem that needs to be addressed? In your, then finally talk about your problem statement itself. You know, what do we know? What do we don't know? And what are researchers asking us to know? And then finally, you give your purpose statement and your research questions. And, and chances are your chairs provided some sort of format for you for this presentation, but that's the usual format. And then you'll talk briefly about your methodology and how you're planning on recruiting participants or, or finding people to work with or, or, or whoever or whatever you're working with, how to handle that. And then you're going to field questions. And so before you do that, you got to put that other slice of bread in there to make this a sandwich. And what you'll talk about then is your timeline. What are you planning on doing and when if they said yes today? And for me, no one's talking about this to my knowledge. And I want to make sure that I'm loud and clear here that in this moment, at the end of your proposal defense, is where you want to say, if it's true, that I am poised to move forward, that if you say yes today, I can get started on this this afternoon or tomorrow or whenever this form gets filed or whenever they allow you to get started or you know when IRB says yes, uh, most likely. And so you'll, be, you'll essentially want to make that urgency of saying, look, if you said yes today, and if I had all the paperwork today, which I'm not, but if, but if I had all the paperwork done today, then yes, I would start. And you might even show a picture of like a box of envelopes, or um, you might have a list um, prepared of some steps that you're going to take, and, and and you want to pr you want to really say that you have this thing ready to go and handled. The other thing, Ivy, I want to say is that that in terms of safeguards, number one safeguard is you're going to be fielding questions, and so I would say three things here. Number one is every time you get a question, I would repeat the question back to them, especially if you don't answer it or understand the question. Ask. You know, if you don't understand, I mean, number one, I, mean, I guess like, if you don't understand the question, ask them a question back and say, you know, am I hearing you right when you say, and, and, and make sure you understand the question before you answer it. That's number one. Number two is there's going to be a moment where you're not going to know the answer to a question in your, in your proposal defense. And you, what you say, you might say something like this, you know, I don't know if I know the exact answer to the question you're asking. But here's what I do know, and here's a question or, or, uh, that I have that would allow this conversation to move forward. Or you might even say, this is what I do know, and here are the steps I'm going to take to find out that answer for us. Number three is there might be some changes required. And I would go into this just fully knowing that and having the confidence that no matter what they ask you, Ivy, you're going to be totally able to handle it, either in the room now or in a month later after you've made some revisions. So, Ivy, I know you have this handled. N asks, any suggestions on how to recruit participants for a qualitative phenomenological study? I need faculty participants from a particular school. And I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for your comments. I, how to recruit participants? Well, I think key thing here, this goes back to what we talked about in another show, is you need to create an amazing protocol of how you're going to communicate with your potential participants and then how you're going to communicate with your participants once you have them. And what a protocol is, is a script. You need a script so that way you know what you're going to say and when. And in your chapter three, there's a section there, most likely called data collection or something like this, or and in that section, you're going to talk about, or in a section locally, depending on what your program requires, you're going to be talking about a list of steps that you're going to take to find people. And you're asking me what those steps should be. And a few things. Number one is, when you're, when you're recruiting people for, for a study, you want to make sure that you're recruiting not just out of, out of uh, the ease of recruiting them, 
like they're you have access to them. They're you know in your office next door or something like this. Hopefully they're they're not in your office next door, but it, it might require that you walk in and you talk to a department chair. I mean this this requires a lot of personal interaction. You might after you have uh, you might it depends on your program, but chances are you're going to go in beforehand and talk to someone in charge and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this study. Here's the, the details of the study. And I need your authorization to utilize the premises here of this school or business or whatever. You know, a very common facet of, of doing a study is getting a, a paper, like a letter authorization on letterhead from the organization you're going to be working with to make sure that you have their authorization to actually be there in any way, to actually be on campus or to be in their business, and to contact their people. And those people who you're getting that authorization from most likely can give you a list of the people that, that meet your sampling criteria. And from there, uh, you, you start making phone calls, you start emailing, you start knocking on doors personally, and, and you follow your script the entire way. So step one, N, is, is figure out who's going to be in your study and make sure you know exactly who qualifies and who doesn't qualify to be in your study. And then from there, walk in to that organization if this is how your school rolls. And I think this is probably how most schools roll. You might want to check on that. <clears throat> Go ahead and walk in and ask a person in charge, like a department head or, or a, a dean or something like this, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this study. Could, uh, could I get your authorization to do this? I've prepared a, a letter, and most, most campuses, most programs have a standard letter that, uh, that you would have signed, and they would sign it. And then you'd say, hey, I really appreciate you helping me. Could I, is there any chance, you know, could I get a list of, of the, the, the faculty members that work here, or, or where could I go to get such a list? And then you, get, then you build yourself an awesome Excel spreadsheet, you know, names, address, email address, phone numbers. Uh, when was the last time you attempted to contact them? Was contact successful or not? And, and you create that type of list. And then after you get approved by your IRB to actually do the study, then you can actually start contacting those participants. And, and I, I guess I'm doing a lot of PSs today. I think another thing I'd like to mention here is the most ultimate situation is if you can get all those people uh, to be in a certain place at a certain time in a certain time period, you know, maybe over two days or so, and uh, or, or um, I, I like many of you are not doing phenomenological studies where you're interviewing people. Uh, if you're doing a qualitative study or some other type of study that involves a survey instrument, sometimes you can get them into a room all at the same time, like a conference or a or a faculty meeting or something like this, and just have them participate in the study right there. Now, in your case, in a phenomenological study, most likely you're doing in-depth interviews. I imagine that's what you're going to be doing. And so for that reason, that's not really going to be possible. But you could recruit them in mass as long as you have IRB approval. Amy asks, how do I write my dissertation in the shortest time possible without any pressure? Amy, the audaciousness of this question is amazing without any pressure. Uh, the likelihood of writing this without any pressure is exceedingly low unless you have the skills of a monk. And I am definitely not one of those people. I thrive on pressure. I love pressure. That's what keeps me going. But, I mean, to, more to your point, how can I write this in the shortest time possible? I think, I think a few things there. Number one, there is nothing, and I'm going to get really serious here for a second, there is nothing uh, in between writing your dissertation and not writing your dissertation. There's no gray area in between there. Either you are any one of us that is watching this, if you either you are have a laptop open or whatever you use is, is on and open and you are looking at sources and reading them and putting them into your laptop in some way, in an in Excel spreadsheet, in, in cards, in, in, in Microsoft, whatever you're doing, there's nothing in between that and doing nothing. There's no gray area. Everyone, I... I get so often, when I'm working with people one-on-one, I get so often where they say something like, well, I didn't do any writing or reading yesterday, you know, but I, but I talked to some people about my dissertation. There is, that is not writing your dissertation. I can't tell you how many times I get lots of emails from people that I'm working with in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, 
whether I'm their dissertation chair, committee member, or or I'm working with them as a coach. And and it's a question, but it's kind of like a question that that's not moving them forward. You know, writing an email to one's chair or or going to the library and uh, and finding a source are very two different tasks. So I think number one is is understand where we're spending our time. Our time is either working on the dissertation and we're writing or we're reading, or we're not, and, and there's nothing else between that. And and so there's some pressure there to actually always be going over to that side of I'm actually working on the dissertation. I'm reading something and I, or I'm writing something. One of those two. And of course there's a gathering phase in that as well. But Number two, are we creating the, 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 the situation in our life that actually can allow us to finish our dissertation? And, and I think the key is, number one, is do we have a workspace that actually allows us to get away from other human beings and get the work done that we need to get done? Number two in that is do we, uh, do we actually get our butts over into that workspace for large amounts of block time and, and, actually, and actually do the work while we're there? And you know, typically eight hours of block time is what's required. And the way you do that is you work for 45, rest for 15, you go on a walk, 45, 15, 45, 15, lunch break, and then just do that 45, 15 all the way. This might be a caffeine, caffeine infused journey, but either way, eight hours of block time are so important. And then on top of that, too, number three, my big number three, is there's gonna be there's massive sacrifices that are going to have to be made to finish this project. This is, this is not like going and taking a small hike. This is, this is a, an Everest quality project. And to climb Mount Everest, not everyone's going to climb Mount Everest. And we can't take everyone with us during that process. And, and that's the hardest part about dissertations is it's going to require us at some point to, to be away from our family for a short amount of time, to potentially take time off work to give up on those vacations, to give up on our Friday night party, to get up, give up on our Sunday morning brunches, to give up on, on whatever the rituals are. And gosh, I remember uh, you know, being a newlywed and working on my dissertation, having to give up, you know, we had you know, multiple date nights a week and having to give up most of those and, and maybe have only one short date night a week until this was finished. I remember I sold my video games uh, because I had a bit of a video game addiction uh, in that early part of my life working on the, that dissertation. So just to say is that uh, sometimes we have to make the space in our life to get the thing done and that's what creates the space to get the thing done really fast. Now in terms of pressure, what I would say is understand your relationship to pressure. Pressure can be a really good thing because without pressure, what's propelling you to finish this thing? Um, and if, and I, I'm not, I'm not a, maybe I'm not a high level uh, feeler like that, you know, uh, but for me, pressure is what, what drives me. So uh, part of me wants to say lean into the pressure, but if you've gotten over that, I'd love to know how you did that, how you got over that pressure. But either way, Amy, what I want to say in general is create the environment and the situation in our life that allows us to finish our dissertation. So everybody, I'm having a strong start to my Monday. I'm exceedingly excited for you and about your Monday as well. I want to know from you, would you be interested in me speaking at your university or college, whether it's in person, via web, or even via a recorded video. Would that be something of interest to you? If that is, in the comments section below, send me the name of your university and the person there I should be talking to. I'll need their contact information, their email address or something. Let me know who they are so that way I can get in touch with them and, and make them a very non-salesy sort of free offer about, uh, about speaking to your college or university. I'm not looking for money here. I'm looking just simply to bless. So if that is of interest to you, let me know. Everybody, it's going to be a great week and I can't wait to show you more. Take care. And make sure you subscribe or like this video because I sleep better when I know that people are watching this show.